Hi, this is Roy Sorensen from Washington University in St. Louis, and I'm here with David Christensen of uh, Brown University, who is the world's scariest epistemologist. <laughs> Not too scary, I hope. Oh, he's the scariest one. <laughs> I, he's more scary than the imaginary guys that uh, uh, Descartes whips up with his uh, when he tries to get a certain kind of skepticism going. Um, I'm used to that kind of skeptic who is, um, they would say, well, maybe you don't know that you're sitting here at your desk because you could be dreaming, or it could, there could be an evil demon who is uh, making it seem that you're sitting at the desk uh, talking to someone. Um, I'm not exactly sure on how to uh, defeat such a skeptic and show that I know plenty of things, but I know plenty of things. Um, yeah, right. And I'm not going to, it, it's, it's an interesting theoretical problem to figure out how I do know so much, but I'm not really in doubt that I know plenty. Um, so it doesn't. So it's an inter So it's like Zeno's paradoxes. I don't really worry about the existence of motion. I'm just concerned with how to diagnose what went wrong with Zeno, uh, and that's a very important exercise. The diagnosis is, is really important. The mere fact that you can block uh, a puzzle uh, doesn't exhaust the interest of it. But uh, David Christensen has uh, a view um, which goes beyond that, which is more than me thinking I've got a problem diagnosing things, but I think one that really would affect my confidence in a lot of views. Um, David Christensen is a, uh, con uh, a conciliationist or a proponent of the equal weight view. Uh, he thinks that if we have a disagreement and we're, we are peers, then we ought to uh, split the difference or our average out I'm going to let uh, David clarify a bit more what his view amounts to. Well, it's a view about um, how we should react to finding out that other people disagree with us. In particular, people who, apart from the disagreement, we think we have extremely good reasons to have a lot of epistemic respect for. And the kind of view that I have been arguing for is that um, when you find out that those kind of people disagree with you, it ought to considerably reduce your confidence in your own belief um, to the point where, you know, if, let's say, you believe P and the other person believes not P, if you really have excellent reason to believe that they are your epistemic peer, that they are as intelligent as you, as honest as you, as hardworking as you, that they've looked at all the same evidence that you have looked at, well, then you ought to suspend belief. So what sort of situation do you have in mind that was a good illustration of your view? Well, maybe the most persuasive illustration um, that I've come up with is an example where you, you've been going to restaurants with your friend for many, many years, and you always calculate the tip in your head. And most of the time, you're both correct. But on the rare occasions when you, when one of you makes a mistake, you've kept track and you make mistakes equally often. So you, you have these um, very, very long track records, which provides excellent reason to think that you're epistemic peers at bill calculation. So then tonight you go out for dinner and you, the bill comes and you do the math in your head and you come out with a very strong confidence that your share of the bill is $43, and your friend says, no, it isn't, it's 45 Okay, now at that point, I think you should become much less confident that your share is $43, and basically become about equally confident that it's 45 That's assuming, of course, that, you know, one of you hasn't drunk a lot more wine or had a lot more coffee or neither of you seems to be particularly sleepy or alert or anything like that. So if you have, uh, what happens when you have, like, some people are pretty confident in themselves. Uh, do you, can you elaborate the example? So I suppose I just hold on to my number. Can you elaborate the example? So, uh, um, so the, the question you want, you're asking Suppose is, I don't. What would you do? I mean, what would, I mean you can make, the, I think you make, so if you have, uh, so sometimes I have people who would stick to their view, but um, then I think you have other yeah. scenarries where you have, like, you, have a much larger dinner. 
I guess, I guess the, you know, what I would say about the person who doesn't uh, reduce her confidence in those kind of situations is that um, they're being irrational because mm-hmm. it's pretty clear that one of the two people made a mistake. The overwhelmingly likely thing that happened is that somebody made one of the little undetectable mistakes in mental calculation that we all know that we make. Uh-huh. And there's no real reason for me to assume that it's my friend rather than I who've made the mistake. So if I keep on being confident in my belief, mm-hmm. that seems irrationally to be um, uh, assuming that it was my friend who made the mistake this time. Right. I suppose it turns out that uh, the, the calculation was done uh, correctly by me, and I was just following, doing what my evidence you know, says I should do. Um, so, according to one view, I should proportion my belief to my evidence. That's you know, that's the only thing that matters with with informing beliefs. That's evidentialism, right? Uh, so there I am. I'm just nice. I'm, I've done the proper thing, uh, and yet you seem to be criticizing me that I should be more sensitive to the other person's uh, assessment. Well, I guess um, whether we think that what I say that we should do is consistent with evidentialism or not depends on what we think the evidence really supports. So you could say the evidence really supports, um, let's say, the 43 view, the $43 sum, um, if, in fact, that's the correct solution to the arithmetic problem. But that's not the only way of understanding what the evidence supports. Um, I would take it that we have not only the evidence that's given to us by the amount of the bill, but we also have important evidence given to us by the other person's belief. Part of this evidence suggests that I've made a mistake in my calculation. Mm-hmm. And uh, so this is me. Yeah. This is higher order uh, evidence. This is evidence about how they're assessing how people are assessing evidence. Is that it? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So the two kinds uh, of evidence uh, that we're that you want us to heed. So we're used to thinking that we should heed the regular evidence that bears on the proposition in question. Uh, but you're saying that it's, that doesn't exhaust all the evidence that we should be we should be interested in how well we're evaluating the evidence. Yeah, and I think that kind of evidence is, even though it, it does come up in disagreement, it also comes up in lots of other situations. So supposing you're a, a pilot and you've heard about hypoxia, which um, happens to pilots and other people who go up to high altitudes where their brains get insufficient oxygen. And what happens in the earliest stages of hypoxia is that you feel totally fine. You feel mentally crisp and alert, but you're not. You're actually making lots of mistakes in judgment. Yeah, there are hysterical uh, exper- experimental reports because some of the, the, the initial experiments incidentally were thought to be uh, immoral to do on other people, so the experimenters did it on themselves. And so they were had these really funny first person reports. And they were just like you say, they, the people felt great and they just until they just sort of passed out. <laughs> they, uh, right. So so the idea is, you know, supposing you're flying an airplane and you've decided to you might you might want to go a little bit farther than you'd originally planned to. So you do some figuring to figure out whether you could go, you could make it on the amount of fuel you have to a somewhat farther away airstrip. And you become rationally very confident that you can. And then you notice by the altimeter that you're higher than you thought you were. In fact, you're now high enough so that in your unpressurized plane, you're at severe risk of hypoxia. Now, it seems to me that that's evidence that's uh, very um, important for you to take account of, and it bears not only on some higher order matter, but indirectly it also bears on how confident you should be about whether you have enough fuel. Uh, okay, so now that was, you've sort of taken us a lot there, so you've got us to be out of the dinner scene where there's only a, a dollar or two at stake to a matter of life and death. Um, yeah. And uh, now do I have to start thinking about you know, whether you're so someone who doesn't believe that God exists and then he's got equally well intelligent people who think that God does exist. Um, you know, the, the stakes have gone up even further now, worried about your afterlife and so on. So now it really seems important. Uh, 
So, uh, so should, should the atheist average out? Uh, should the theist average out when they, if they think that they're, they're peers? If they think that they're peers, yeah. So that, that's a very hard question, I think. And a lot of the literature on disagreement so far has been concentrating on what you might call toy cases, um, cases where there are two people, and particularly where the people have the kind of track record that would give you the strongest possible evidence that the other person is, in general, just as good as you at doing a certain kind of figuring. Now, so that that's what's extremely clear in the restaurant case, or in other of the cases that we've looked at, you know, in some of the papers that have come out on this topic. And I think it's actually very hard to um, figure out how to take the lessons of those artificial cases and carry them over to real life questions like um, theism or atheism. So when I think about um, theism or atheism, um, I think, well, I know I'm an atheist. Uh, I know there are a lot of theists out there. Do I consider them my epistemic peers? Um, what kinds of considerations do I take to be those which um, make somebody good at figuring out whether there are gods or not? And I think it's a lot less clear in the case of theism than it is in the case of the restaurant, mm -hmm. or even that it is in the case of, let's say, fairly cold-blooded philosophical theses. Because um, when you get into religious theses, all kinds of um, emotional effects um, will influence our thinking, and it's hard to, um, to sort them out in a way that um, that gives, at least for me, a clear sense of, of who would be my peer. And yeah. Well, maybe that's going to help. One of the one of the reasons why I regard you as the scariest epistemologist is I feel all my distinctive views about things um, going gray. Uh, that I should be averaging out about my I have a theory of stuff on vagueness, for example. I'm a partisan in this debate. I think that. Uh, there yeah. are sharp thresholds for big predicates. Very few people uh -huh. agree with me, and I right. have to concede that they are they're just as uh, up on the literature and, and so forth. Um, I'm uh, got views about uh, the, the nature, you know, the solutions to various paradoxes. Uh, yeah, lots of stuff like that. Uh, stuff right. I spend day in and day out working, years and years. Yeah. And then, well, I feel that pain. <laughs> I definitely feel that pain. I mean, I have those kind of views, too. I have views on, let's say, whether rational belief is closed under conjunction, uh -huh. things like that. And I know that people disagree with me, and I have a great deal of epistemic respect for uh -huh. them. And those are the kind of issues that I think, um, unlike maybe the theism issue, those are the kind of issues where I kind of think I do know what makes somebody a good philosopher. At least I have, you know, strong beliefs about what makes somebody a good philosopher. Uh -huh. And it includes things like intelligence and familiarity with the literature and a certain kind of sensitivity to argument and honesty, uh -huh. of course. Uh -huh. so, and, you know, I've talked to the people who disagree with me and they score high on yeah. all those. Uh, so for me, um, I do experience the graying out that uh -huh. you're talking about. I, I don't think that I can be I'm very confident that, let's say, rational belief is um, not closed under conjunction or needn't be um, subject to consistency. So is, is there a threat, though, it's going to gray out even further? Um, so what about why, why not, um, you know, with just crazy people? Um, so if I, um, the thought is, that in the restaurant case, I think it's just equally likely he's right than I'm right. Now I might think that if I take, I might say, "Well, he's just the fact he disagrees with me shows he's not quite as good as I thought, and I have evidence right here, and so I should demote him automatically because he disagrees." Yeah, right. yeah, that's an important point. I think the whole kind of position that I like to push um, depends on the kind of move that you just talked about. It depends on my refraining from demoting my peer in the restaurant on the basis of the fact that 
she got 45, and the answer is 43. So, of course, whenever we disagree with somebody, we begin by thinking they're wrong about the, about the topic under dispute. Um, and the, um, to me it seems, anyway, that if you're really worried about figuring out who it was who made the mistake in thinking, that there'll be something question begging, let's say in the restaurant case, about me saying, hmm, one of us made a mistake in thinking. Which one was it? Let's see, the answer is 43. Oh, Roy got 45, so Roy must be wrong. So he made a mistake, so I don't need to worry. So um, the case for reducing belief depends on um, sort of walling off or bracketing part of my reasoning when I assess the other person. In other words, I'm not supposed to assess the other person down merely on the basis of um, the belief of their holding the belief, which I think is false. Fair enough. Sounds very reasonable. But that sounds like something bad's happening. Next. <laughs> yeah. So the, the worry then is going to be, well, if I'm supposed to be, let's say, bracketing what's in dispute between me and the other person, then what happens when I meet somebody who essentially denies pretty much everything I believe? Um, well, there it seems that if I bracket all the stuff that's in dispute, which is pretty much everything, I'm certainly not going to have any um, dispute-independent reason for thinking that I'm the one who did not make a mistake and he's the one who did make a mistake. So then don't I have to epistemically compromise with him? Okay, so that's, that's the, the worry is that once you start bracketing, to try to get the right answer in the restaurant case, then you're going to be swept into um, outrageous degrees of skepticism um, as soon as you meet somebody who, you know, denies pretty much everything you believe. So I can avoid that. Now, I have, I mean, here's how I'd like to avoid it. Um, there's two different ways of, of thinking about um, how you evaluate the other person with respect to peerhood. Um, one way is you think, well, I should compromise with him epistemically if I don't have any dispute independent reason for favoring my own position or for favoring the um, proposition that I'm more likely to have gotten it right than he is. And that's the kind of um, formulation that would get us in trouble with skepticism. But I think we could do better. I think instead of saying that, we should say something like, I have to compromise epistemically when putting aside the matters under dispute, I have positive, very strong evidence for taking the other person to be equally likely to get the thing right as I am. So that's what I have clearly in the restaurant case. In the restaurant case, the long track record is precisely a very strong reason for me to believe that my friend is equally likely to get that matter right. So there's no presumption of equality. You don't get it just by default. Yeah. You've got to earn it. That's right. The, yeah, there's no presumption. And the, pers the, you know, the person who denies everything so that, um, you know, uh, that there's virtually nothing dispute independent for me to use to evaluate him on, well, there's, it's not the case in that, in that um, situation that I have strong dispute independent reasons for counting him as mm -hmm. my peer. So you've got to, the epistemic respect that, um, that you have to give to the other person, which might cause you to lose confidence mm -hmm. in some of your beliefs, that epistemic respect okay. has to be turned. So let me, uh, there's other ways people talk about um, testing for peerhood. So what about this probability test? If I figure that uh, Dave is just as likely to get this kind of question correct as I am. Um, that's, that makes us peers in my eyes. Is that, is that correct? Just going. That seems like a good yeah. philosophy. Because you now we skipped all the stuff about I the mean, virtues and what we care about is just going to, why were we interested in the intellectual virtues? Uh, only because of the probabilities, right? Okay. Yes. I think ultimately that's right. Because we, we think that, you know, intelligence and things like that are Right. important because they cause people to Right. And if we were, right. sometimes you're in unusual positions where you have, where intuition does better, 
uh, I heard that if you want to judge, if you want to make your judgments align best on jam with what the experts say, it's important that you not think about it, <laughs> that you just taste the jam. Uh, yeah. Uh, really? <laughs> there is, or if you're on face recognition, this is more more practical significance. I've heard that it uh, it backfires if you verbalize that much about the person's face. Uh, it interferes with it. Oh, really? It makes you yeah. less reliable? So there are some, pecu some of these psychologists yeah. who stress the importance That's of really intuition. Um, it's it's uh, not as, you know, it's generally you, you are better being analytical, but uh, there are some important uh, cases where it backfires. Uh, so, uh -huh, you're yeah. overthinking so it. it looks like uh, the probability criterion works well then, whereas the intellectual virtue criterion, um, or at least the exercising of the virtues, <laughs> Uh, would, would, yeah. wouldn't work as well. Yeah, and I yeah. think that, that feeds right into what you said, is, which is that the intellectual virtues are important precisely because they lead, at least in, in you know, many cases, yeah. to the probability. I was also thinking that uh, it's important in how you select the peer. Uh, suppose I, I mean, for almost any view you have, I can fish up some peer who disagrees with you. Um, so that yeah. there might be 99 out of 100 who agree with you, but I'll be able to find the, that hundredth guy who disagrees. Right. And if you know that I've selected that person that way, uh, that peer is not going to have the same influence on you, right? Right. Yeah, one thing we haven't talked about is numbers. And that um, hasn't been talked about much in the literature because the literature has mostly been toy two-person mm -hmm. examples. But if we're really thinking about the real world, of course the numbers are going to count. Um, and you, know, you can see that even by toy examples with mm -hmm. numbers of people. So if if um, ten people are at the dinner table and and nine of them get one answer for what our shares of the bill is, and one person gets the other answer, then you know we're all going to think that the answer that's gotten by nine people is more likely to be correct. Um, and something like that's going to happen in um, in public controversies as well. Although there are going to be complications due to the fact that people's opinions are not necessarily as independent in that situation as they might be in the restaurant situation. So if 99 of the people are, you know, blind followers of a guru, um, then it might not be that their opinions count 99, you know, for 99 right. separate people. Well, the manner in which they form, so they make you know, the stuff on belief polarization where on political issues people will there are certain, you know, fanatical groups that will follow, will be very well informed, but they only get their information from the source they already yeah. agree with. And those people, right. although they're well informed, are, you know, this, uh, you don't want to average out as well with them. <laughs> right, yeah, they don't count as a lot of separate yeah. people in a way. Right. Because, I mean, the fundamental idea is that we're trying to, to catch our epistemic mm -hmm. mistakes. And, you know, we, just like you can catch the mistake in your thermometer by noticing that it disagrees with other reliable thermometers, you can catch the mistakes in your thinking by, notice that, by noticing that you disagree with other uh -huh. reliable thinkers. And, uh, you know, the, the more thermometers or thinkers on one side, if they're independent, the more yeah. of that kind of evidence. You so get. one thing that's going to be making you different than, I mean, you're, as part of this being scary is that you, you, you're scarier than the other scary people, or you scare them. So the scary uh, skeptics who um, they they think that um, that you know they want to have doubts about whether they have hands and so forth. Uh, right. They should be worried by you because um, it seems like you're going to be winding you you wind up agreeing with a lot of like what G. E. Moore says when in his defense of common sense he gives this long list of propositions which have been denied mm -hmm. by many philosophers. And also, or they always either deny it or they say they don't know it. So G. E. Moore thinks yeah. that uh, it's you know plain that he's had he's had his breakfast before, you know before his lunch. It's essentially, that time is real. <laughs> he believes that yeah. uh, uh -huh. there's uh, he's lived at or near the surface of the Earth for many years. <laughs> right. He believes the Earth's yeah. been around for many many years. <laughs> uh, yeah. He's uh, he thinks. I mean, if many is over 10,000, that's kind of yeah. right? Oh, Moore did not count uh, that God exists, interestingly, as a, a common sense proposition. Uh -huh. um, but he has a pretty long list, and I, I, uh -huh. I think you sign off on all of them, 
and you also have extra, you have some reason that's distinct from him. Um, you're, uh, you can point to all these people who are your peers who believe all these things. Um, so this seems to be bad for the skeptic. The skeptic prides himself on being rational. And insofar, he admits uh -huh. that there are these other people who are just as rational as he is, and just as, in, well, I guess informed, <laughs> as well as a skeptic can be. But yeah, right. You know, yeah. They're going to say that. Yeah. They're not going to say they're less informed, I guess. They're going to say we're all, you know, equal, they equal us out in other ways. Um, that uh, they are, they, they can't really afford to average out. Uh, they're under rational pressure here to abandon their uh, skepticism. Yeah, that sounds right to me. At least if they're going to, once they concede that the other people who disagree with them are real, then uh, they have, I think, exactly the problem you yeah. were describing. Um, I mean, there's other, other people, you know, people who have these strong views. I mean, you're a little uh, cautious about doing the politics and uh, some other areas, but one of the reasons you scare me is that it, um, most of the views that I'm tempted to, the more, you know, I'm uh, a uh, uh, real liberal about uh, drug laws, for example. I don't want any drug laws. I, want to, I think it's all, it's like, uh -huh. makes all this crime. It's like prohibition. You know, it's, it's, bad, it's bad like that. Right. That doesn't seem so common of you. <laughs> uh, so it's maybe common in academics, yeah. but not so common in the general population. Um, so, should I be averaging out and think, well, we should have maybe, you know, more prohibition? That seems, I'm reluctant to do that. But, uh, um, yeah, do you think that do you think the people who disagree with you about the drug laws, insofar as you can put aside your disagreement about drug laws, do you think that you have good reason to think that they would be as likely as you to get that kind of question? Um, my guess, no, because uh, the, they Yeah, I sort of guess no too. I, I I'm not very good at explaining why, but um, at least. You know, my initial reaction is... You know, yeah, I'm still worried, though. I mean, I can just, suppose I, I do think myself is better informed on the issues than 90% of people. I'm still worrying about this other 10%. It uh, doesn't require a lot uh, of the population to be a worrisome group to form my peers. No. Um, That's the, right. uh, it may be an ill-chosen example, actually, on the, on the drug laws, because actually it's very hard to find that much rational opposition, at least the ones that the academics will... Uh, but there are other issues on political stuff, I think uh -huh. I can find uh, differences. Sure. And it seems like uh, getting a reason to stay home and not vote, um, that uh, who's to say? <laughs> who's to <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, and one, of the, one of the questions that people have raised is, I think related to what you said about not voting, is it seems that, you know, unless you think of yourself as pretty special epistemically, if you really think that you have vast numbers of peers out there on some issue, and if you have access to their opinions, then it would seem that on my kind of view, you don't have much reason to think about the issue directly. Right? And so far as you uh -huh. want to get the rational belief, uh, your your contribution mm -hmm. is going to be pretty piddling. Yeah. That's, that's you know, a labor-saving aspect, isn't it? Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, maybe that's correct. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I kind of think it is, or at least I would think it is if I, my confidence weren't tempered by Yeah, let's get into that. So what, one of the things that, another reason why I think you're so scary is because of the reactions I get from students. One of the, the students really want to refute you. They're much more animated about refuting you than the Cartesian skeptic. I mean, I can convert most of these you know, in an uh -huh. intro class, I can get most of them to say, okay, I know little, very little, you know, and on to the next activity. <laughs> but when I... <laughs> right. Yeah, I don't, I, so I don't have yeah, parents. But so when, I, when I talk about, you know, your views, they, they really want to show that you're wrong. So here's one kind of objection uh -huh. that they will alight on, a real zinger type of objection, they think. that. So uh, what about that view itself? So this view that you give... Your, your peers equal weight, or this conciliationism, that itself is a controversial philosophical position. So uh, it implies that uh, you should abandon your own position. <laughs> yeah, well, you've got some good students there coming up. Well, they're that. trying. Boy, they're... Um, they're, they're <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's, you know, that's certainly something that um, 
that has been pointed out. And I think it's a really interesting, uh, it's an interesting phenomenon. Um, I think that I don't, in the end, worry too much about whether that shows that the view is false. Mm -hmm. um, for one thing, I mean, it, there's no contradiction in supposing that the view is true, but that it, um, that I can't mm -hmm. rationally believe in it at this point. Um, and uh, a second point is that uh, if you think about um, pretty much any reasonable view about disagreement, or actually lots of views about what should make you lose confidence in beliefs in general, um, you'll find that a lot of them will fulfill the following condition, that in certain circumstances, the view will tell you not to believe itself. Um, so the, the proposition that if I believe P after thinking about it for 10 minutes while high, and then I find out that, you know, hundreds of people have been studying it very carefully and have soberly and intelligently come to the opposite conclusion that I should lose confidence in P. That seems like a pretty uh, sensible position, but it too will self-undermine in certain cases. We can describe a, a case pretty easily in which um, that principle would itself tell me not to believe it or to lose confidence in it. So the mere fact that a principle will self-undermine in certain conditions doesn't itself show right. the principles wrong. Yeah, I think it's a pretty, uh, so the, some, uh, from Derek Parfit's work on reasons and persons, um, there, some people point out that utilitarianism implies that uh, you ought, you know, I suppose bad, that it'll be bad consequences if you believe it. Well, then utilitarianism says, well, don't believe it. Yeah. <laughs> don't believe my theory. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, it doesn't show that utilitarianism yeah. is false. Uh, it's, it's, it can be limited as a, well, anyway, it, you know, you can, you can, you can divide the belief from the, from the, yeah. no, from, uh, the truth. Uh, yeah. Now, there is, I mean, there is something more disturbing about um, the kind of view I want to push than about the, the little, the silly view that I talked about a minute ago, the obviously true one. Um, and that is that in the present circumstances, um, the view that I like does undermine itself. Um, because presently, many philosophers, um, many really good philosophers, philosophers who I respect a lot, mm -hmm. um, reject my view. So my view tells me, don't mm -hmm. be so confident in me. So when you get up and you lecture, I mean, do you feel bad? You think, oh gosh, you know, I really ought to just lecture on stuff I believe. You know, I get they've been here. They are. They treat me very nice. <laughs> yeah. they, they they fly me in, and here I'm going to uh, advocate for a view, and I don't believe the view. Golly. Yeah. Well, sometimes I've titled my talks, "Why You Should Not <laughs> Believe the Conclusion of This Talk," which it, it actually makes the students more uh, interested uh, in coming to the talk. Um, but. Um, uh, I guess two things. Um, one, I think it, it, it can make sense to um, advocate views that you don't. Right, so you're you're really you're not requiring so um, maybe for a point of intellectual exploration or yeah, just a yeah exactly. In fact, you know something strange when I when I've talked to different philosophers about my view, their their reactions have come into two categories. Um, there's one category that says, what, you're telling me that I have to not believe in free will anymore? That's ridiculous. I can see where the other people are wrong. Mm -hmm. I can see mm -hmm. why my view is right. Forget it. But then I think about an equal number of people say, what, you believe your views in <laughs> philosophy? I don't believe my views. I just argue for them. That's what we do. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't actually think I'm totally mm -hmm. in that second camp of people who just yeah. argue for things but, um, because that's the position they've chosen. But I think it, yeah. it makes sense to do that. Um, and it, it makes sense, you know, I think in science, it certainly makes sense to have people exploring various... Yeah, but then this is the, there's a difference. So in debating um, competitions, one of the things I'll do dramatically is I'll just flip a coin to decide who, which team will take which positions. 
just do. So uh, I've never yeah. seen any philosophy go that way. Uh, that uh, people come in as as lifelong yeah. partisans of a view, um, and uh, though. Uh, yeah, I I try to make uh, my students do that in their papers, but I have to. Well, actually, I saw it was done once. Oh. Once I have to admit, there was a it was a party that had. Uh, it was Paul Churchland and uh, Daniel Dennett, and at the reception they threw tablecloths over each of uh, each of these philosophers, and uh, made gestures and did a, a, a mind transfer, and so the mind of uh, Paul Churchland went into uh, <laughs> Dennett, and uh, Dennett's mind went into Churchland, and then they proceeded to argue with one another, but from their opposite viewpoints. Yeah, and they were and they were quite they good. That? Oh, that really cool, <laughs> they actually. were very good at uh, <laughs> at uh, explore, you know arguing from the other's position. Uh, it was a very impressive performance. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's definitely a good skill to have. But you know, you are right. I mean, I, I, I mean, the second point I wanted to make, you know, after saying that um, it's perfectly okay to advocate for positions that you don't really believe. That I have to admit that I do believe um, mm. some of my thoughts. Now, is it because, right? So uh, I, when I read I uh, I the psychology literature on overconfidence, so I, you know, uh, people, you know, so ninety percent of people believe that they're better than average drivers. Ninety percent believe they're better than yeah. X, and you know, they, they always put themselves. They, there's a real strong tendency for almost everybody to put themselves at the top half or even the top quarter. Um, and they will also agree, uh -huh. evidently, that most people are overconfident, but they're not. <laughs> uh, and do you think this <laughs> right, is just right. uh, part of this kind of buoyant human condition, which uh, we're we just as we are uh, not we're, we're kind of overconfident, uh, but maybe we, and also we're we're we don't bracket enough, uh, and, it's, and you're part of that. Is that it? Can't help yourself. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, I guess, yeah, and I guess I do, you know, the only difference I can think of between me and the people that you're talking about is uh, I will say that I'm overconfident, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't have the effect on my ground level beliefs that... Uh -huh. um, but it sounds like it has some, doesn't it? And, you know, I guess, you know, it can, it can, uh -huh. I mean, it, it sort of ebbs and flows. Um, uh, you know, when I really think about it and I think about my views on disagreement and I think hard about, let's say, how smart mm -hmm. Tom Kelly is and things like that, right? Then I think, wow, I really can't be confident mm -hmm. in this. You know, it might well be false. I might mm -hmm. be making a mistake. But then, you know, I play backgammon and drink, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, I become again confident in my mm -hmm. ordinary views. Yeah. Um, you don't sound that upset about these deviations from the rational ideal. Uh, well, I'm I'm pretty uh, pretty resigned to being far from uh, ideally rational. Uh -huh. Um, but it, one of the, I mean, you, in your, um, your your key article on this, you talk about uh, disagreement, but the good news that it's supposed to kind of help us be more moderate. Uh, uh, yeah. And so you think that even if we're not moderate enough, we're still it still has some some impact on us. Yeah. Right. I mean, the, the good news is really that the that the disagreement of other people can serve as a uh, check on you something which can, you know, tell you, hey, you yeah. might have been making a mistake. Now, right? you generally talk about actual people, um, and uh, I just wondered if you, what about possible people? Um, so I, when I, uh, can I just Im imagine a peer and uh, use that as my check? Yeah, that's, that's a question. Um, and uh, I know Tom Kelly, in his first paper on the topic, argued that, that uh, merely possible peers should be just as worrisome as actual peers, um, and that purely possible peers would only be um, problematic if they were rational. And so if I think that, you know, if I think about purely possible peers, I think, oh yeah, they would be rational and disagree with me, then I should be worried. But then I should be worried anyway, because that would mean that my arguments for my mm -hmm. view aren't that good. Um, but I actually think that um, it's not really true that purely possible peers um, are anything like the threat to the rationality of my beliefs that actual peers are. 
because if you think about the role of actual peers as being kind of um, uh, alarm bells in the, in the sense that they are other reliable thinkers who whose disagreement can indicate that your own thinking has gone awry, then they are kind of like, you know, um, if you have a watch and you notice that other watches disagree, then even though you're generally confident in your watch, you will lose confidence mm -hmm. in your watch. But if you have a nice watch and you're confident in it and then you just... It, 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 it dawns on you that, you know, in some possible world there's a watch that disagrees. That really shouldn't upset you mm -hmm. much at all. Um, so we all know that, you know, we can make mistakes but uh, in thinking. But when we find out that people who have, um, who seem to be just as well positioned as we are epistemically, have come to disagree with us, and thus that one of us has made a mistake, that raises the probability that... Um, we made you know, so let's let's not just be so indiscriminate. Take any possible peer, but take one that is uh, a kind of a relevant one. So it would counter. So when people lose confidence in their religious affiliation, when they think about a uh, if if they had been uh, brought up, uh, so a, a Christian thinks, well, if I had been brought up a Muslim, then I would have Muslim beliefs. If I'd been brought up as a Jew, I'd have been Jewish beliefs. Um, that yeah. That makes them worried, and it seems like they're not just picking up a possible um, peer. <laughs> it's it's right. Yeah, those are actual. I mean, I mean, you can think of it in terms of if yeah. I'd been raised in, you know. Well, it doesn't have to. He doesn't have to. House. He, what, what about my? You know, uh, I didn't want to. So, in the counterfactual, I have an actual person, as it were, going to another possible world. But the, just suppose I, my imaginary twin. <laughs> I don't have a twin, but the, the twin would just be like me in all relevant respects. If that twin had been uh, raised as a Muslim, you know, then I would be a Muslim. Uh, that kind of... Yeah. Now, it does seem to be just purely possible, but very relevant. Yeah, it does. Um, it's, it's partly relevant because we know there are actually people who are uh, raised as Muslims and disagree with people yeah. who, you know... Have I guess I, I, just, I suppose I was a... So, so I'm not sure that's, to that's different yeah. from the disagreement problem. Well, I think that, you, that the... Um, let me just press a little bit further. I mean, even if I were, a, even if I were a solipsist, I think that I'm actually the only person. Uh, I think it would still be instructive uh -huh. to consider. Well, if there were other people, what would they believe? Um, and yeah. if they, if they're my peers, these possible people, then I would make adjustments for those for those people. So, I, you know, my impression is that you're too. Uh, there's, there's too much of a fetish with the actuality. <laughs> That what, I, what we care about uh -huh. is, is um, we care about how things are selected, so that we don't want things rigged up. So just not whip up artificial possibilities. We don't also care about actual peers' yeah. difference, disagreement, given that it was contrived that the talk show host just brought someone who is going to disagree with you, and you're not going to therefore average out. Right. So it's a matter of selection. Yeah. That sounds okay. That sounds right to me. Um, yeah. All right. So uh, I wanted to. Um, also express another possible point of disagreement. Uh, I'm not sure. I, you know, I talk to you. I have this tendency to to, <laughs> to, uh, to sort of be persuaded, or we wind up agreeing the same. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, the uh, but the the one of the things I think is that we're, we're, there are certain statements like "it is raining, but I do not believe it," or uh, mm -hmm. I could, I, "if I believe that, then I'd be open to rational criticism." That there's something inconsistent, even though there's not the proposition itself isn't inconsistent. Um, it's something it's inconsistent yeah. for me to believe that. Yeah, and and uh, that makes it right. tough, if not tough for me to, or impossible for me to rationally believe it. Um, but you don't have this hang up that I do about uh, what Roy these when the, the Iyers are referring to Roy Sarns and. Uh, yeah, so I can believe right. it. And you, you do believe I have some false beliefs, in a matter of fact. Uh, so you can you can right. make, you can reel off some false beliefs with science, and but I'm I draw a blank. I can't come up with any, even though I know they're in there somewhere. <laughs> um, right. I can talk about my past false beliefs. I can talk about my future false beliefs, perhaps, but not my present ones. So uh, wouldn't this give? Wouldn't this limit how much uh, agreement? Uh, couldn't we have a disagreement about such a proposition? Sure, we could. So I could believe that um, 
it's raining, but Roy doesn't believe it, and her. And you right, could not that's the idea. That, right? And as much as we okay. debate it, or cheer evidence, or as much as I esteem you as a peer, we're not going, we can't get consensus on it. Right, so, uh, so you're imagining a disagreement where what we're disagreeing over is one of these yes. more sentences. And you're wondering yeah. what, what to say about those. Um, so I guess, there, are you imagining a case where, um, where mm -hmm. let's just fix on a real example. So it's raining, but Roy mm -hmm. doesn't believe yep. it. Is that the example? Okay. So um, supposing I believe that. And what do you believe? Oh, I, I believe that that... I know you're not believing that, but I'm, I, you're believing that you disagree with me about the rain part or about the what Roy Oh, uh, I could just, I could merely just disagree, disagree with the, the conjunction, but I mean, you can choose as you wish. But either way, I don't see what, what turns on it. So I guess, um, yeah, I'm not sure either. I was just trying to sort of feel uh, my way step by step on this one. Um, if we're disagreeing about the rain part, um, then it seems like, if you, at least if you think that, that I'm your peer about rain, um, then there could be pressure on you to change your mind, not to, to change your mind in such a way that you would believe. Yeah, I couldn't more for the whole conjunction, but for one conjunction. Contradiction, but, yeah, but, you know, you, you switch out the conjunct, and then, you know, you would, um, you would believe, yeah, it's not, I can't remember what, which, which of the, what the rain belief was that you had that I didn't, but, you know, if you, um, started to withhold belief on rain, um, then that would be a switch in, in response to the disagreement, even if you didn't then embrace yeah. the more in conjunction. Um, nevertheless, it does seem like, you know, what I'm concerned about is not just getting one of the conjuncts. I'm talking about the whole conjunction. And that's what strikes me as, so the, um, uh, our whole big book on these things, the blind spots, and they, my impression is that we don't have equal access yeah. to all the consistent propositions that uh, the, the range of what we can believe is uh, idiosyncratic. Each person has a different, different sets of blind spots. Uh, and that, that will, right uh, that, so it's harder, so sort of as it were, epistemic space isn't flat, it's bumpy, and we have different uh -huh. bumps. And that yeah. means that the evidence can't move us the same way because for sometimes the evidence would have to push us over a bigger bump than for other people. Um, uh -huh. And then you would get some, uh, I'm not sure how much you're going to get, but you get some disagreement even amongst ideal thinkers. They could have, nobody's doing anything wrong, uh, but since it involves a blind spot, uh, one of these, say these Morgan statements, um, then, um, you know, we're not, we're not, we don't gray out yeah. there. So you're, so, so you're thinking of a case where, I don't know exactly how it would go, but there would be a, a Morian claim, and in order to yeah. um, epistemically compromise with your peer, you would have to give a bunch of credence to the yeah. Morian claim, which right. you can't do on Right, so, so what, uh, an application is the surprise test paradox. I think the, the teacher says there's going to be a surprise test next week. And um, it's going to surprise the students. That's what it means. Not their, not their parents. It's going to surprise them. And then you have a clever student say, well, you right. can't give it to us on the last day because then on um, the night yeah. before, we'd be able to predict right. which day the exam's on so we'd foresee it. And then uh, yeah. the really clever step is next step when he says, well, could you do it on the previous day? Well, then I would, from the, you know, uh -huh. is it, did I see the Thursday or Friday? Well, I can see that you can't wait till Friday. So therefore, I can eliminate Thursday as a possible. And then he goes yeah. all the way back, you know, all five days of the week or right. all, you know, 365 days of the year or however much. It's a funny, weird kind of slippery slope. Um, and the solution that I like is to say that uh, the teacher can surprise you by, by giving you the test on the last day because what would happen is that you would, uh, you would no longer find the teacher's announcement credible. The teacher said it would be a surprise test. And, that yes. now has the form of it's gonna you're gonna have a test um, tomorrow, but you don't know it, and people can't right. they can't know such a proposition. It's a blind spot that not the students can anyway. If this is right, it could be true, and it also true. more importantly, 
their right. parents, who are not amongst the surprisees, they they can know it because it's oh, not a blind spot for them. So you can imagine the debate blind between spot. the teachers. Right. Yeah. I mean, between the students and their parents, the parents say, study for this test that's going to come tomorrow. And the student, um, yeah, right. I would take that to be a, dis and he, they, the puzzle's set up so these are, you know, ideal thinkers. Uh, so they're, uh, so that's an example, you know, a philosophy example of a, a what I think is disagreement amongst ideal thinkers. Yeah. And I think that, you know, um, I don't know if you think this, will, this is, uh, loses something of the coolness of your example, but um, a sort of si more simple-minded um, case that might be analogous is if somebody disagrees with me about something that's logically true. Supposing I have a belief in some logical truth and somebody else... Yeah, that's a good, that's a good kind of case. I'm kind of appealing um, to some of the same thing, because your, your point is that you know, here it's a matter of consistency. It doesn't consistency trump everything, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, I mean, I guess what I want to say, probably in both of these cases, is that there are going to be um, dueling epistemic ideals. And you know, you're if so, if you know some great logician is telling me that this logical truth that I'm believing is not actually true. Um, and I think, well, wow, I mean, so it's, you know, fairly complex and I, I actually do see how it's true, but he's telling me that I'm messing up. Um, and I think that if I keep on believing it, I'm, um, falling short ideally in, um, ignoring evidence that I have made a mistake. On the other hand, if I go ahead and reduce confidence in the logical truth, then I'm, you know, uh, to the extent that I believe the negation of the logical truth, I'm embracing inconsistency. So, yeah, it's, a, it's a kind of a rational dilemma there. Uh, and that generally, yeah. I mean, I've heard of rational dilemmas before, and they tend to be kind of these very special circumstances uh, where things are set up so that you must violate one of these norms. But you have a, a much more wide, tragic vision of them. That they're happening at the restaurant and they're yeah. happening, happening all over the place, aren't they? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that that one of the one of the interesting things about um, about taking into account evidence of your own malfunction is that once you start taking it on board, um, and that evidence can be misleading, right? That um, it's gonna uh, you're gonna have evidence that you shouldn't do what you're, what actually you should do, um, you know, absent the evidence, and that's going to cause in lots of cases, um, places where you're going to be ending up violating. Yeah, maybe you can, um, so you, you have these other, to, to get a little bit off of the, the disagreement stuff is, uh, a lot of your peril with the, uh, you have these scenarios in which someone's worried that they've taken a drug that will addle their, their reasoning, um, so they, yeah. they've done a logic puzzle. Um, they seem, and actually they've done it completely correct. <laughs> um, and, but since they worry that, uh, they've been drugged, um, they're not as confident in their answer. And that seemed, and so, you know, we, right. that's how we, I think most, you get, you got us, most of us do feel that way, <laughs> that we would lose our confidence if, I mean, it may have been just complete, uh, placebo that was given to us. We, you know, so nothing has really been there hasn't been any kind of dam you know, damage to our reasoning ability. Yet, if you if you're worrying about that possibility, if you're a rational suspicion, then you're in, in this kind of odd situation where the you have conclusive evidence for the right answer, and yet you're not exactly. supposed to go with your conclusive answer. Um, yeah, right. Um, and you know, there are there are definitely people who say uh, you have to go with the conclusive answer there. Um, yeah. I can't bring myself so he, to me, buy that. Um, I think it, it, you know, taken to its extreme, it's going to say that, you know, when you're a pilot and you, you know, you see the altimeter indicates that you are very probably hypoxic, then if in fact you're not, mm -hmm. if the altimeter is malfunctioning, let's say, then you're entirely yeah. rational in, in uh, you know, believing you the result of your recent thinking and 
I guess, practically rational in you know yeah. turning towards the more distant airstrip. And, yeah, uh, it seems to me that you probably could be disciplined for that. <laughs> they, that they discovered that you, that's how you reason them out. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, that's, I wouldn't want that pilot. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. So I, yeah, that's a, but here's the, one thing that worries me about it, though, is that, um, how to work out, so there I am, I'm, I'm using this higher order reasoning um, to, uh, to, to bracket what's gone on, uh, to some degree at least. Uh, that, what about that reasoning itself? How do I know my hypoxia hasn't kind of screwed up my higher order reasoning? Doesn't it, hypoxia would screw up everything, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think it does. So, I mean, I guess you have to, uh, you have to think that um, hypoxia is likely to, I mean, I guess you have to be, um, if you thought that hypoxia was going to make your, your thinking processes yeah. completely crazy in every respect, yeah. then I guess you'd be paralyzed. I mean, I think there's some kinds of higher order evidence that you could get, yeah. which you can't do anything with. But I think, in fact, in the hypoxia example, you can um, retain enough um, enough of your, your, you know, mental composure to, and, you know, even on the assumption mm -hmm. that you are hypoxic, um, reason to it being preferable to stick to the flight plan that you arrived at before taking off than the one that you might have drawn up. Yeah, the so it looked, um, it's an interesting uh, psychological speculation whether there is um, something that's a bit insulated from these assaults. So, I mean, pretty con you can, hunter gatherers would get very tired. Uh, they, you know, they've been chasing after the stag a long time, and oh, uh -huh. you can see that people who right. are sensitive to the higher order evidence are going to have advantages. Um, and so, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I don't know that I'm not a psychologist, but it seems that huh. it seems that you might be able to get evidence that it is a bit quarantined. Uh, one of the things that occurred to me, sorry, before you talk about flight plans, like conservatism seems to be something that becomes attractive. <laughs> I'll stick to my original plan. I won't try a new, a novelty. You know, if I get worried, then I... Yeah, if the if the higher order evidence is, is yeah. targeting your more recent um, thing. I'll, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so maybe there are certain policies that become natural for us, you know, that... And I guess... Uh, they're built in to be kind of less risky or something. Or, yeah, or it might just be that, that um, you know, another another dimension of difference might be that um, under hypoxia, I might be able to, to you know, think uh -huh. of some relatively simple thoughts, like I don't rely on stuff I did, mm -hmm. uh, you know, under hypoxic conditions. And that I might think that those would be more likely to come out correct than, you know, delicate thoughts I had about you know what mm -hmm. the wind speed is, and how much fuel is, and you know all the you know all the kinds of you know delicate things you have to think about when you're figuring out whether you have yeah. fuel. Well, those are interesting speculations. Um, so I, um, so we're, we're we should be wrapping this, but I was just wondering if you have any uh, uh, predictions about yeah. the long-term fate of the conciliationism, uh, the equal eight. So right now you think there's disagreement, um, but I want to give your sympathies with Bayesianism. You think that. Over the long haul, in the next century, two centuries from now, um, we'll all be conciliationists. I mean, I guess I, I think that there there has already been some pulling together, at least on examples. But um, I I guess at this point, I would find it hard to separate the prediction that we're all going to become conciliationists from. The belief that conciliationism is true, so I, I think I shouldn't make that prediction. Uh -huh. But it's a hope. It's a hope that that uh, you know I'll keep writing articles, and you know the first article I wrote, I I sort of had a footnote saying, well, if I write this article and people aren't convinced, um, then I yes, I remember that be confident in the conclusion. And of course, I was hoping yes. that I would write the article and everyone would be convinced, uh -huh. and I wouldn't have to you know pay that. Yes. But, you know, sadly, uh, probably predictably, that did not happen. And so I, I, I hope that we can all become conciliationists, in which case I can become a conciliationist mm -hmm. not in bad Well, that, that's, a, that's an interesting uh, verse. So what scares other people is an uh, object of hope for you. 
Okay, well, good. Thank you very much, uh, David. And I think this is a good point to, to, to end right here. Okay, it was great talking to you. Bye-bye.